Kidding, kidding. Some of you may not even know him anymore. But the people who come from my generation simply know that he was the shit back then. Between 2012 and 2015, everyone heard Kid Ink. Especially here in Europe, his fan base was really big. Besides Tiger, Wiz Khalifa, Chris Brown and Fatty Wap, Kid Ink was the shit. His music spread a lot of good vibes. It was very mainstream, which is by no means bad. But he didn't rap about violence or gangs. And I don't know if it was the same for you, but for us, he was so hyped. I saw people running around with his merch, this alumni merch, and you just heard his music everywhere. But today you hardly hear anything from him, because the guy has become completely irrelevant. And I asked myself, how could that happen? That's exactly the question we're going to answer in this video, and we start at the very beginning, at the beginning of his career. Brian Todd Collins was born on April 1st, 1986 in Los Angeles. Inspired by Pharrell Williams and Swizz Beats, he started producing beats and songs as a teenager. At the age of 15, Brian met a rapper through mutual friends who went to his school. This rapper sold CDs there from time to time, and he was a certain Nipsey Hussle. Through the mutual circle of friends, the two became friends. They learned together how to make music. Which equipment do you need? How do you deal with it? And when they had learned all this, they bought their own studio. And so Kid Ink also produced the song Bullets Ain't Got No Names by Nipsey Hussle. That was the song that Nip got his contract for. In addition, this song also opened some doors for Kid Ink in the industry. At the age of about 22, Kid Ink himself really started rapping. Back then still with the artist name Rockstar. So he released his first mixtape, The World Tour, under this name. This album was even really successful for a debut mixtape. That's why he also got attention from the industry. And so he got his first contract with the alumni group. But on this label, there was already another artist named DJ Rockstar. So pretty similar to Kid Ink's old artist name. And so the then Rockstar changed his name to Kid Ink. He got the name because he's just addicted to tattoos. I mean, you can see that about him. His whole body is fully tattooed. And now Kid Ink was just hustling. Alone in 2011, he released three mixtapes, on which there were also some very strong feature guests. Among them, for example, T.E. Dollar Sign, Meek Mill, Sean Kingston, Tyga, Nipsey Hussle, and many more. As you can see, Kid Ink was already very early in his career, very well connected, and so he was also part of the XXL freshman class at the beginning of 2012. This year also, a certain future, Iggy Azalea and French Montana were there. And in June of the same year, it finally came. His debut album, Up and Away. It was ranked 20th in the Billboard charts. A complete success. And around here, I also became aware of him. At that time, no one had any streaming services. At least that was the case with us. And yes, I had my first smartphone and then had a cracked app at that time. And then sometimes songs were suggested. And then Time of Your Life was there. And this song was also on this debut album. And oh my god, this vibe just grabbed me. I felt it right away. Other tracks on this album that I celebrated were, for example, Never Gave a Fuck, and of course, Hell and Back. That was his most successful song at that time. And also the most successful song of this project. After this album, a mixtape followed. You could tell him that I've been from hell and, back. and at the beginning of 2013, he signed his first major label contract with RCA Records. So at this point, Kid Ink made it possible to build up a very strong fan base. He was still underground, but people knew his name and he was definitely respected. But oh shit, in the next few months, there were real bangers. When producing for this video, I had real flashbacks. The first single he released via the label was Badass. Shortly afterwards came the Almost Home EP. Among other things, Money on the Power and Sunset were on it. These are also two songs that I celebrate a lot. The EP managed to chart it to 27th place, which is definitely very good for an EP. But the final breakthrough came to Kid Ink in September. Here he released the song Show Me Feet, Chris Brown. The song then went more in the pop direction, but dude, the song was such a hit. Everyone heard this song. Believe me, the track went viral. At the beginning of 2014, his second studio album, My Own Lane, was released. This was probably the peak of his career. In my opinion, the album was incredibly strong. In addition to Show Me, there were also records such as Is You Down, 
Main Chick, Rollin and Tattoo of My Name on it. All songs that I pumped a lot. The following year, in 2015, two more projects came out that I extremely celebrated at the time, and some people too. On the one hand, the album Full Speed. I even found the album even stronger than my own lane, because I just thought there were even more good records on it. I'll tell you which songs were on my heavy rotation at the time. Body Language, Hotel, Coolback, Be Real, Every City We Go, Abound Mine, Blunted and Like a Hard Boy. I not only observe with myself, but also with my fellow human beings, that they connect these songs or this album in general with a very uncomplicated time. The songs were also more for the mainstream, they were very poppy, and you could easily get into hip hop. That means people who actually didn't listen to hip hop at all, listened to Kid Ink. And I think that's exactly why it was so important at the time, because I think Kid Ink brought one or the other into this hip hop world at the time. As I said, two projects came out in 2015, because there was also Summer in the Winter, which was also a very strong album. But in my opinion, it didn't reach full speed anymore. But that's just my opinion. My favorite songs on this track were Promise and That's On You. But then this blatantly constant phase of Kid Ink subsided, because until 2021, only four projects came out, much less than in years before. Incidentally, the success of his sold units also decreased significantly. But why wasn't Kid Ink so consistent anymore? Quite simply, he set other priorities. On the one hand, he simply focused on his family. In the meantime, he got married and had children. And with his family, he just wanted to spend a lot of time at home, which is completely understandable. But he still produced music and made music himself. Nevertheless, he also had problems with his label. He announced this in 2020 when he left this label, RCA Records. Roughly speaking, he meant that he was held back artistically and release-wise. As you know, labels can make a lot of decisions. They can decide when an artist will be releasing and what kind of music he will release. And maybe that's why Kid Ink was held back, because he didn't feel like releasing that much. And after the hit Show Me, Kid Ink's style has changed a bit in the pop direction, as I said before. What I can completely understand, I mean, the direction has gone completely insane. And so Kid Ink has his early listeners, i.e. the people who also celebrated him as an underground artist and just loyal fans were neglected. Which, as I said, is not negligible. I mean, an artist has to change so that he grows. You just have to go extremely with the zeitgeist when you're mainstream and stay extremely consistent. And he obviously didn't do that. And that's exactly why he collapsed and disappeared from the picture. Even if, as I said, he always released a bit, if not a lot. Financially, he can definitely make it. I mean, his old hits are still streamed up and down on Spotify, on the other streaming platforms for sure. And he's also known for being very smart about his money. Whether he can make a comeback again? Difficult. For this, he would have to release another hit like Show Me with some big artist as a feat. But I don't think it will come that way anymore. Because in my opinion, he is currently living out his reclaimed creativity completely. He makes the music that he simply likes and feels. I found it incredibly interesting to edit this video. Because, as I mentioned earlier, I connect Kid Ink with a very uncomplicated time. And yes, I also find his music extremely timeless. And I also know that a lot of young viewers didn't know Kid Ink at all. And I just wanted to show exactly these people who was before. 21 Savage, Moneybag, Yo and Co. back then. And who the people listened to back then. If you click on the video on the right, you will see a summary of all 6 x 99 beefs. Not lying, all beefs, you heard it right. And on the left, you will see a video about Lil Durk. Thank you for watching people. Leave a comment and also a rating, I would be very happy about that. See you, take care, see you next time, ciao.